So I just want to uh, make a couple of comments on this uh, track of results uh, for investment presentation that Rudy's going to make. But I just want to say I was over in Pendleton uh, with Mr. Mulvihill there, and we had an incredible meeting of the uh, around the um, the uh, Eastern Promise. And it was, it, it felt like, kind of like one of our regional solutions teams almost. I mean, the energy that was in the room uh, and the incredible uh, partnerships, both public and private, uh, focused on actually not just on um, uh, increasing the college going culture and increasing the number of degrees that kids attain in high school, but also connecting um, uh, very young children who might, 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 might not be otherwise hooked into a, an early learning program. With uh, uh, with an early learning program through the public libraries, uh, and uh, it was just very elegant, and I think speaks to the tremendous um, possibilities involved with with uh, uh, extending the achievement compact concept outside the direct education community to a whole host of other partners in the community that I think are anxious to to play a role and make a commitment to support this uh, this agenda. So it's a good show. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the reasons that we uh, are trying to have the, uh, this retreat, if you will, uh, is to try to gain a better sense of clarity about the what roles and responsibilities of the, uh, of the OEIB. And I know that uh, there have been some birthing pains uh, since we passed this uh, legislation, uh, and, uh, and I think we probably have some yet to come. But I think it's important to just take a minute and step back and appreciate really what we've accomplished in the last 18 months, which is really quite remarkable. We've, we've uh, uh, hired our chief education officer to help uh, guide this effort. Uh, we have introduced the concept of, uh, of achievement compacts and a, and a budget that's focused on, on strategic investments. Uh, and we've uh, adopted a strategic plan. And I don't know if you've got the vision adopted this morning, but uh, both of which will be, I think, very, very important to guide our work going forward. I also recognize that the, the OEIB has had a tendency uh, to mean different things, represent different hopes, and I imagine different fears for different people. Uh, and I think it's very important that the authorities that we have right now and the, the relationships we have with their boards and other agencies remain uh, a work in progress, uh, that we, we evolve and adapt as, as we go forward. But there were two specific issues that we were trying to respond to uh, when we created the OEIB, the first one was that we need to have a single system of public education. And for some kids, that starts at, at, at birth and goes through up, up into their working lives. And that that system had to be much better aligned and much better integrated. And the second one was that the state needs to be much more strategic in the way it invests in, in, in education if we're really going to meet these aspirational outcomes that we've established for ourselves. So I think that, you know, debating a big number, while important, is simply not enough. If we want better outcomes for students, we have to be, have a much better sense about how those investments are actually connected to students and to strategy. So as Nancy says, we need to be budgeting a plan rather than uh, just planning a, a budget. So to me at least, the OEIB is a P220 board and it's an investment board and it's focused really on sort of large strategic uh, outcomes and overarching strategies as opposed to other boards which are much more focused on sort of the details of budget and, and, and rule making for the operation of the, of the school system. And I think by adopting the strategic plan, uh, we've gone a long way towards uh, identifying both our, our key objectives and our core strategies that we want to recommend to others, in this case probably the legislature, and that we want to implement ourselves over the next you know, three to seven years. Um, so it seems to me that the key question before us now is, is basically how do we monitor our efforts as a board and how do we actually adapt our efforts based on what we learn from, from that monitoring. Uh, we've spent a lot of time thinking about the roles and responsibilities of our local education partners. Uh, I hope that we're willing to spend as much time looking at ourselves and asking some key questions like what is it we want to achieve, uh, how will we know when we've achieved it, uh, and uh, how do we um, uh, monitor uh, our, our success or lack of our success, how is that, how is that going to be measured. And um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, uh, that uh, we can come out with a clear sense of that, and I think the presentation that Rudy's going to make on um, on tracking for uh, uh, investment results will be a good start. So, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Governor. Um, 
So this morning, uh, we had an opportunity to um, at least start this conversation um, with an eye toward um, using some of the, or not some of, but using this particular uh, uh, sheet filler as the frame of reference for how um, OEID would, in fact, uh, track results over time. And um, that conversation, I thought, was a pretty um, helpful one in that <clears throat> not only did it shape or reshape some of the things that will be on this sheet, but also, um, you know, it did help us to sort of begin to talk about some of the data points that we both have and uh, versus what we don't have but need. One of the places to kind of take the introduction you just gave um, is to um, start identifying um, a couple of things. One, um, there have to be, or at least there likely will be, some uh, softer data uh, measures of our work, um, particularly in light of the fact that some of the hard data measures that are in, in, in embedded in this uh, metric um, are probably not going to be baked by that time. Um, so if we were to uh, be sitting in front of, you know, a, an editorial board, uh, and if we had to define, hey, listen, you guys have been in existence for the better part of now a year, um, so now what's different? What's better? What's, what changed? Um, what are the things that we actually, on the soft data or hard data side, would actually uh, be willing to advance as evidence that, you know, there's, there's, there's a different educational uh, dialogue or a different educational outcome on the, on the horizon. And one of the things, and again, the board can chime in with this, but one of the things that um, has been intriguing to me is this question of what the nature um, of, uh, you know, h how has leadership changed? Um, at every level in this state, whether it's uh, in, in K-12 or in terms of uh, the early learning uh, uh, centers, uh, in parents, in communities. I mean, are we affecting who it is and how it is that people actually begin to pick up the gauntlet and lead? One measure that for me is, a, again, this is a soft data measure, but it's something I would submit to the board, is whether or not there are conversations in communities that are bringing, where the conversation is eliciting or bringing forward more and perhaps new faces in the realm of leadership. Are we seeing more people stepping up to the plate and beginning to actually own some of this? It seems to me that our dialogue, our ability to be successful is a function of how many conversations are communities having themselves, led by themselves, owned by themselves, even chiseled out of their own logic and, f and pain. But it is essentially how many and where are those places that's happening. When you describe the work that uh, Mark uh, has done over in Eastern Oregon, when I had an opportunity to see it last uh, year, when you've seen some of the people who've come forward and already started with some of the achievement, com the original achievement compacts and so forth, what I view that as is this is the sponsorship of people feeling now empowered to tackle this thing on their own, and that they are bringing that resource as a new kind of intelligence to the game. And I think we ought to start taking stock of things like that. Again, it's, it's, not, it's not a hard data, it's not on my metric sheet, it's not something that, but, I, but we should be thinking about this in very, very um, different terms than just what did the needle do in ter terms of third grade reading? I, we know we're going to have to monitor that. We know that that's going to happen. But are there some other specific, seemingly intangible, but very vital, um, necessary parts to this transformational piece? How would we know that we have moved away from control and more toward commitment? Like, what would the evidence be of that, that we would accept as being evidence that we are now doing a really much better job? People are coming forward. They're leaning into these conversations. They're bringing their own data to us. They're knocking on doors and asking for help. I mean, that kind of thing. And i just like to hear 
a conversation with the board about, well, what other kind of, of ways should we be assessing our, our own, uh, you know, monitoring our own results over the course of, uh, not necessarily just this year, frankly, it could be any, could be any year, but just, you know, are, are there some other metrics beyond this? We had the conversation this morning on this. <coughs> But um, ideally, there would be other points of, of light as well. You want to go around? Uh, yeah. Mark? Yes. However you'd like to do that. Hey, Mark, well, I just said one that occurred to me I, as I listened this morning to our conversation. I think one that um, we've already taken ground on are the legislative changes. So what are those things around policies and legislative changes uh, that at least in the long term, we do see are going to enable us to have this P20 system. I think a lot of the work of a board, and especially one like this, whose role is at the policy level, is I think a challenge is to identify what are those things that we really think are going to make the big differences going forward. And when I just think about you know the fact that we have Rob Saxton and Dr. Crew and the board and have moved forward on key uh, funding strategies and those kinds, those are some big things. Um, I know mandate relief is one we've talked about. I, I think that, from at least from the field, the perception is that <laughs> we still have new mandates coming. Even though there might not be mandates from the legislature, there are other mandates in other ways, like moving to Common Core and those kinds of things that we know are things we have to do. But I think that wherever we can not only track by policy, but also if there's places we could name that we have taken off the plate, um, would be measures of success, I think. Um, and then also the places where we may be identifying barriers that we couldn't identify until we peeled back a few layers. So even if we haven't taken ground on them, if we could identify that we now know these are new ones that we need to work on. I think that latter point is really very significant because you, one of the things we're discovering with our CCOs is that we're running into problems we never even imagined before because they're really operational and, and uh, yeah, it's a very good point. You know, people people like to be around and learn and things that you, you don't even realize. Uh, you know, you, if you were to plan ahead on a metric, plan ahead on some a partner being involved, you don't even realize that you didn't include these people who want to join later on be a part of a winning organization. And what, what I'm getting to my point with that is, Rudy, you're talking a lot about what is in the second part of the Regional Achievement Compact. So that's pretty much the essence of that. Right. And I think, Michael, we're doing some work on the rubric and our organization on the rubric. Uh, I think we should measure, besides the measures we have here, I'm looking at number four here too, Rudy, that you have a satisfaction indicator on here in professional yeah. support. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, in one of the districts I worked in, we did the Harris Interactive survey, and it was basically a satisfaction survey, and it was all quantifiable data. <coughs> if we were to embed this type of discussion into that second part of the achievement compacts, have clearly defined rubrics, and even have like an interactive survey connected to that. That would give us a whole other element of data than what we've been focusing on previously. And I think then you've got, you know, like the governor said, you've got CCOs coming in that want to align and indicate with that. You have other entities that will, that you don't even realize right now, that would be part of that rubric discussion. <coughs> If you're looking at different people being involved, um, the number of the number of educators who are engaged in the compact committee work that's being done, I think that we've got more members than ever working on professional issues in this area. I'm not sure um, necessarily that we've got to the parent outreach that we that we want that component as because the compacts are supposed to be part of the budgeting process, and we're just now getting into that phase. And I'm hopeful that those conversations will be going out and that parents will be um, involved and understand if and what the, um, the local priorities are and, and what's embedded in that compact for strategies and tactics that 
those educators and administrators who are jointly working on that believe will help them get there. And I think that is, that's getting to what Rudy talked about, that commitment, mm -hmm. that we're all in it and we all need to be a part of it. Well, first of all, Governor, i got to say welcome. I left the house this morning. My wife says, be sure to tell the Governor that this is a great, great uh, facility here. This is a good example of a church and a, and a city coming together to build this facility. And particularly, you want to use, you know about the free clinic downstairs. They're doing 500 a week wow. here. Free clinic and also dental work, too. And a safe and sale hospital with a bunch of money. So, uh, mm -hmm. anyway, so welcome. And I think I bought that chair here in the the uh, fundraising that <laughs> 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 you're sitting on. Maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe, more, maybe more than just one. <laughs> uh, Good job. Uh, you know, I, I, this is leadership thing. I, I, I like the frame in coaching. If I'm watching this March Madness, I didn't see one coach on any of the winning or losing teams score a basket. And when we take off, when we take off on what Rudy said about uh, more leadership with people in the communities, I think that, 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 that's, that's, that, that's what's going to happen because the, the, the power of the ownership in, in taking ownership in the communities is going to be by your coaching, your leadership. And I think that's how I see us. If we, if we can, if we talked about it a little bit before, but if we can get the communities excited about the end, you know, with these, with this uh, score scorecard here. If we get the communities, what the people who who have not been engaged before, but can get engaged, the the people that we know who are in the communities, I think we really have significant uh, possibilities here, and that's, that I think I see that part of our job. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'll just follow up because it's also what we talked about in the first part of the morning too was the buy-in, the engagement of the public and education community, and I see that ultimately really as the arbiter of the success of this board. It's, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, ideas, innovations, reforms in education, some bad, some good, but the ones that have failed have failed because of lack of buy-in. In this state, Sim and Cams, I mean, proponents, opponents of it, but even the proponents would admit it didn't really get that buy-in that it really needed. And I think I'm, it's really good the discussion we're having, talking about engagement of the public education community, because that's that's going to be critical to the success of this of what we're doing with the zero through twenty system. Uh, there is a lot of uh, skepticism of anything top down. I think. Uh, maybe that came out, I was joking about the niceness comments that, that Rudy made, but I think some of that is kind of lack of, of building that necessary coalition and foundation among uh, the communities out there throughout Oregon. So um, I would say that's something we're going to have to do. Otherwise, you know, honestly, we have lots of metrics, lots of goals, and you know, I, I get the sense out there that some of it's just going to be give the OEIB the numbers they want and they'll go away. And, I, and that's just, uh, it's going to be a real shame if that's what it turns out to be. But I, I think that's the danger we're in if we don't create that necessary engagement to, be, to speak frankly. And just to add one more thing, uh, I think we need more connection with the boards out there, State Board of Education, State Board of Higher Education, and looks like the uh, Higher Education Coordinating Commission. And as Dick mentioned, the ELC, the Early Learning Council for that matter, and some of the other commissions uh, that were involved, we have liaisons around the table from. And I don't know if it's really something we can, you know, um, take you know, it's necessary to adjust to the, uh, discuss on the agenda at the meeting, but the chief education officer is now sending out briefs, regular briefs to us as a board, and it wouldn't hurt to get some updates, you know, either directly from those boards and commissions in their liaisons or through that brief, but to know what's going on, because I think some of it's parallel and some of it really is not coordinated, and that's not really uh, the 0 through 20 system we're talking about. 
Yeah, for me, are, uh, one of the things I'm really looking for, and I don't know how you get at this, but I want to see teachers and students arm in arm together and get excited about the whole educational process. And to me, if that happens, we will know we've had a winner. And that's a little harder to get at. But I think about the high school students who are sort of, you know, come see, come say, um, they may like going to school, they may not like going to school. But I, I, I like what Hannah was saying about Diana was saying about teachers being engaged and that we can make that connection with students so that they are excited about what they are doing in the classroom. This will have been a success. Yep. So I, you know, I think ultimately we're responsible to make sure Senate Bill 909 gets implemented. I think what we've really focused on this morning is this important of it's going to happen through the communities for them to really own. And just one thing that came out of this morning's conversation, which I think is great, would be that each of us come up with 20, 25 leaders in our community that could have a meeting with Rudy or, you know, the appropriate people to really have, um, so that, that Rudy is engaging with leaders in our community around this, so that people are getting motivated, really understand it, but people are getting to know him and the work happening for the OEIB. So we were looking for some, you know, important roles for us that are at the policy level. So I think it's part of our responsibility to make sure the community is engaged. Yeah, I see, see two challenges. One is we've got to have, and just to kind of from your colleagues and bend on this, I we have to have a process where the policy is actually driven by educators. Mm -hmm. We need a way to in, in, ensure that what we're doing makes sense at the point of delivery. It's like uh, being a legislator in an ER doc. Uh, you can make budgetary decisions, which are budgetary decisions, and then you can go home and sort of see what happens when people lose coverage, for example, and come into the, to the ER. So we need, that's one part of it. The other part of it to make that successful is this community buy-in. And, and I, you know, I, I really believe that, that there's, there's magic in creating a vessel where people are doing things together on behalf of a shared place. There's some real power in it. There's a little book by a guy named Dan Chemist, who used to be mayor of Missoula, Montana, called uh, Community in the Politics of Place. It's just a little quick read. But it, it really is about what happens when you get people together and they feel that it's their community. And the meeting that we had uh, over in Eastern Oregon, I, and you can duplicate this all over the place. You can dupli duplicate it in watershed councils. You can duplicate it in all sorts of different ways. It's just uh, had... had um, the head of the CCO was there because they, they, they suddenly realized what the P through 20 was about and that they have every both financial interest and human interest in making sure that kids are healthy when they get to school because that's less chronic illness coming into their CCO, which is operating on a capitated budget. Um, the public libraries, who when these kids come in and check out a book to get this, what's the card called? Ready to learn card. Ready to learn card. Uh, and there's a deposit made in their in a college savings account for them every time they check out a book, and then it connects them to the school's the sort of social uh, messenger service, and they send out developmental texts to them count cars with your kid today, and it connects them to the Facebook <laughs> at the school. And there's just a whole host of business people and folks that you would that, that I think really want to engage, and they don't know about it. But to me, that's and it's like the old levy elections, which were such a pain. Uh, but the community was engaged in, in those levy elections. They knew what was going on, and we sort of lost that. And there's an opportunity here to really, to really, uh, to really bring that back. Um, the uh, the um, well, so I've got a, a list of things that were just identified by members that I will again incorporate as a part of the the OEIB um, scorecard. Governor, just by way of um, identifying a little bit of the conversation we had, we also uh, talked about one way of being able to enable us to um, both track and use these uh, results is not just in relation to the OEIB's sort of report card on itself, but, uh, but the one that would be um, about uh, my performance. Um, here as well, and that that would be something that you and or um, uh, the, the uh, vice chair and or a subcommittee thereof, or however you'd want to do that, uh, would be uh, certainly privy to you know, deciding upon and 
uh, and creating as your, at your leisure, at your will. Um, but, but one of the um, secondary sort of parts to this conversation that I thought, again, we'd spend a little bit of time on was um, even if we have a, a scorecard and we make uh, an effort to frame it around both hard data and soft data measures, um, at some point, um, the conversation moves outside of us and into a legislative process, uh, which for me is my first time here going through that. And one of the things that will happen in the, in the near term probably is going to be the question of, so we gave you X number of dollars to run the education system over the course of this year. What happened? What happened to the benchmarks? What happened to the commitments? What happened to the, uh, to the uh, things that you said in the last, uh, in the last session? Um, and I have been reminded of that by some of the legislators with whom I've met um, who essentially have said, you know, listen, we, we kind of remember a day when we'd have conversations and it kind of was water off a duck's back and uh, it didn't result in anything and so now you're asking us to now do a same, do another investment and what's different about why we should believe that this will re result in anything uh, different from the outcome of the, of, of the past. Um, they raise a very legitimate issue uh, about, you know, continuity, uh, about clarity of outcomes and the willingness to share those outcomes outside of our own world here. And um, to that end, on um, page five, Seth, if you could tee up page five for me. Um, I took a stab um, at this question of continuity uh, when we were passing the strategic plan two months ago. And my effort here, feeble as it may be, was to simply draw our attention to the fact that as a board, we're not obligated to a one-time commitment to the field. We're obligated to a multi-year right. commitment to the field with a, a continuous flow both of of investment dollars, but also good data and feedback as to what happened as a result of those investment dollars. And it seemed to me that as I'm now going through the legislative process and hearing, you know, what they're interested in going forward to 1517 and 1719 and so on and so forth, that it might be it might be useful for us to start thinking a little bit about now how do we want to thread this needle going into yet another biennium, albeit we're not out of this one, but at least thinking strategically about how do we want to start this work that we're in right now, connecting to the work that we want to be doing uh, on the next wave. And so what this page five represented was, if we said seven years from now, we want to be doing the following work, the work that at least, and I quickly went over it again this morning, the work that I specked out was we want to be in the bucket of work that actually demonstrates that we have built the capacity of this education system to respond to the needed connections between labor and the economy. That would be an area that we really desperately need to, to, to make sure we've got traction in. This is specific to the goal that we had that when people graduate from one of our institutions here that they find work within 12 months. Right? And that, so what, would, what does that look like from a board standpoint you know, for us to be doing more of or less of? Uh, a second one was if we were going to be seven years down the road and we essentially needed to define the work that we'd be doing for, continuing, for continuity purposes, there's career training and building this college-going culture. I don't think one-year uh, investment in the college-going culture is going to be enough. I think this is going to be a good five to seven years of an investment strategy. It probably will morph and change over time, but that this bucket is never this bucket is not going to go away in the next seven years. A third one is communities for healthy children. Governor, you had mentioned one day in another conversation about the need to start bringing the health community more and more and more directly in connection to the education community. And so I picked that up and, 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 and placed it in this category of the next seven year bucket. I like um, that emotionally centered term. Pardon me? I like that emotionally centered term. Yeah, it, 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 it speaks to my need. 
um, which I still have a lot of growth to do. <laughs> um, the, the fourth area w was this whole issue of family support of learning. Now, specifically for me, this was really much more, or at least as much, about the issue of how do we want to use technology to start reaching many, many more people uh, and providing kind of a, if you will, a mass level of communication and support, new people coming into the state, demographic shifts changing uh, the face and color and, and level of, uh, of poverty and all kinds of things of our state. Well, how would that now, you know, result in there being new and different ways of being able to reach people as soon as they come into, um, into, into this state? And the last is, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about academic preparation for the purpose of being more literate, um, having greater numeracy skills, being eligible for placement in a two- or four-year institution, graduating. But this really speaks to the issue of academic preparation um, around this issue of civic literacy, the idea here that you belong to a community, and it's a community that you have, if you will, an obligation to, and it has a community, uh, and it has an obligation to you as well. So there's a sense of, you know, how, how we should be thinking about civics and civics, I won't even say civics instruction, but, but how do we think about the notion of civic mindedness in the context not only of communities, but in the context of student learning. So these would be the, the buckets. My question to the board essentially is, are these accurate, are they not accurate? Do you think this is kind of where the scope of work will you know, eventually morph into? Are there things that are not in here that you think should be here and so on and so forth? Well, I think the, um, having not spent a lot of time looking at the chart, um, I think what what's, speaks to me from this is the is really the um, the integration or the inter relationship between all of those little, all of those paths. Obviously, um, I think the family support of learning is just a huge one, um, and that's um, very related to the uh, the community the, com the communities for help for uh, for for healthy children. I mean, a lot of these things. Uh, speak well. They speak to both the front end, which is really where you get the big gains, but also uh, um, the actual educational process itself. I think it's very good. Now, this assumes that there are going to be gains on the academic side. This assumes that we will have worked through the kinks of loose, tight, tight, loose. It assumes that it w we've worked through um, a whole so a host of issues around data and data delivery and so on and so forth. It, it, you know, it doesn't to make light of the things that we've got in our front door right now. It just simply says, when people in the field say, listen, I, I'm willing to start a pilot, I'm willing to help, you know, advance the ball here, but don't leave me in a lurch two years later and withdraw this money. Mm -hmm. Don't give me hope and then withdraw it because there's no more dollars right. in the budget to be able to continue this massive program that I'm undertaking right now. So what I've tried to do here is to just build the container so that we can continuously have this sort of flowing conversation, not so, not so much about a two-year investment, but what would a five- to seven-year investment look like. So it shakes me there's about four things that are necessary for this sort of one of them you spoke to. You've got to have adequate uh, and stable funding. Right. So, I mean, you've got to, it's got to be adequate, but it also has to be predictable and stable so that you don't... Secondly, you've got to have buy-in by the education community, that they have to own this, feel like they own it. The third one is you have to have buy-in by the community, which is, a, I mean, to, because I don't think you can be successful without that, so the community has to own it. And then the, the fourth one is you do have to have that pretty robust longitudinal database right. to be able to actually uh, tell you whether or not you are on track right. or whether you need to make midterm uh, uh, course, course adjustments. As we talked about this, and I think I go back, I don't remember what meeting it was, but when the governor came in and shared different people's responsibilities to us for education to be successful in the room, we talked about students' responsibility, parents, community. And I think the family support of learning is a component of that, but I think as we talked just a moment ago about the shared commitment to really seeing change in Oregon. Um, families, yes, need to be a part of that, but if we're not all in it together, 
it's not going to be successful. And I, I can tell you, if you're in a, a school and the principal comes and they say, well, we're going to implement this program and you're going to do it this way, it's not as successful as if there's buy-in and commitment by everyone. And you can get, as a leader, you can get the same thing, I believe. You lead by helping people understand the issues and getting their buy-in and commitment to do that. So that's the piece here I think that could be missing for me is that shared commitment to the work that we do. By the larger community? Yeah, by the larger, by, yeah, by each, I think you outlined yeah. everyone, um, yeah. parents, students have a commitment. It, it really pains me when I hear examples of the student who comes in to take the standardized test doesn't really care. They're not going to college. They right. could care less. Right. And that that doesn't help us get there. And how right. do we help that student care about mm -hmm. that? And, mm -hmm. and what, how do we get parents to care about some of the issues that we're dealing with um, and, and, get, and give them the tools that they need to support their, their mm -hmm. child? Because we're a very poor state. Poverty is a huge issue for us, and our parents are struggling, two and three jobs, and they want to help their kids, and they're not able to do that sometimes, and how do we help them be able to do that um, as a community? Rudy, primarily, who do you see the audience for this document being? Well, this document was for the board, as it was prepared. This document was for the board. What I'm describing is our dialogue with the outside world does not stay contained to this document. People ask the question, yeah, are you gonna, are you gonna fund this for five years? Because I'm, I'm in, if, if it's more than a year, I've had the experience of people funding things and then it goes away and then I've gotta rip it out of my school. Let me give you a classic example is uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, Young Ladies Leadership Academy, right? So they've called already and said, listen, you know, this was a largely um, poor um, African-American and Hispanic school that got shut down. Now they're calling and they're saying, I understand that you are trying to, uh, you know, that the, there's money that the governor's put aside for dollars to be going to pilot programs that will extend opportunities for young women and for uh, students who are in uh, poor communities, challenged communities, uh, in STEM. And we'd like to open up, we'd like to, we'd like to at least open the debate as to how we can use that pilot money to get this school back on its feet, right? I then talk with the superintendent, the superintendent says, Rudy, I'm more than willing to do it but you can't make a one-year commitment to this sort of thing. You've got to make a multi-year commitment to this sort of thing, right? So we're, the, 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 the reality is these conversations span five years. And we've got to be talking, as an investment board, we've got to be talking about what's the, what's the level of commitment in dollars and cents, and I'm not talking about actual dollars, but maybe what's our framing of, a salute, of, a, of, a, of an answer to, to communities that are saying, I'm in, I'm leaning in, I'll go, I'm trying, I will do this, but don't rip this floor out from under me at the end of uh, six months or a year. I, I, I didn't, I agree with you 100%, I didn't get that from reading this document. So maybe instead of focus over the next seven years, a sustainability plan, mm -hmm. investment plan, because when I'm reading, what I like about it, Rudy, is you know, we have all of our indicators over here in our education jargon. But it, to me, this resonates for communities outside of our jargon. This is, if you look at those results, more are going as employed today. That's, that's what we are looking to sustain for the next seven years, is that end result. That's the ultimate 30,000 foot level, like we were talking about, indicator at the bottom. So I, I guess my feedback would be, when I looked at this, I didn't take away from where you're passionate about. We're going to sustain this effort. We're going to persevere. We're going to reinvest, but it's not going to be done in a year. So maybe the title itself, rather than what our focus is, our sustainability plan, 
to deliver for Oregon. For Oregon. That's why the hesitancy now to come out of the barn is, you know, uh, we, 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 bought the, we drank the Kool-Aid on the first round, you know, and so now you're asking me to do this again and so forth. So uh, I'm just going to be saying, and these are not intended, these categories of work are just intended to say, listen, we, we, got, we got four strategic objectives, I mean strategic uh, investments now, initiatives now. Are they going to be the same for going, going forward, or <clears throat> or should we be thinking about other ones, you know, down down the pipe here? And if so, how do we start getting geared up for that? I think that would be really appreciated because we haven't talked about that a lot. We haven't talked about long term. We stated the term governor, you know, adequate and stable funding, but we haven't shown a commitment past the biennium. Okay. I think this goes a long way for people who may need to be a little more innovative, to take a few more risks, to know that there's at least a philosophy and a vision out there to support that. Right. And, you know, I think the 10-year budget frame that we're setting up can, can facilitate this because you can sort of make sense. Pretty. So one of the things I was wondering in the, in the categories of work, and it might not be a category of work, it might be something that lies over the top, but it really was around that um, innovation, risk taking, continuous improvement. So even as we lay out a sustainability plan and, a, and categories of work that we're committing to over the long term, I would want to see some sort of commitment to the to the innovation and examination of the tools that we're using, um, technology, all, all of the things that we've barely scratched the surface of that might um, impact the focus as we move forward in this fast-changing world. So I think about that idea, there's just an and I would add, and that is um, whenever we talk about innovation and pilots and give individual examples, I see there's always this fear like, so what if we're not one of the examples? And it's about the scalability and scale-up. So if we say we're going to invest and we use language like we're going to start with pilots and we're going to pick some of these key things that we think are really good models, for example, what's going on in Pendleton, um, and we talk about the long-term investment, is it a long-term investment to that particular plan? Right. And do we have a plan for how Scale that up. scales up to every community who might want to duplicate that thing? Very good point. Well, if I may. Yeah, no, 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 no. Well, I, I think it's, it's like a business plan of, a, of an initial public offering. It's an IPO. And if, you have, if you're soliciting people to invest in your idea to sell a widget, you want to have your very best foot forward as you're going along, because eventually you're going to have to go public, which you really want a big ROI on. Except we're already public, and we're already going on and on and on. So I think, I think to get what's in it for me thing is missing, or has been missing in the past. Uh, I, I have the advantage of listening to all of you and having the buy-in from the governor, but there's a lot of people like myself who haven't had that vested interest, who are out there needing payrolls or doing other things, but they're also the champions in their community. So I think we have to uh, be, and Hannah said it also, is be, be collective in a collaboration and how we're dealing with uh, at 30,000 foot, but still being able to present the face of this IPO plan, this new uh, year and a half uh, OEIB, Oregon Education Investment Board, and the name itself is Investment Board. Are we challenging the people that we want to be invested that can make a difference, or are they just saying, I'd be here today and you'll be gone tomorrow type of, uh, type of attitude. So I think it's uh, significant to believe that, that we have... Uh, to concentrate on getting the people in the communities who will turn around 
and I love to demand that from the system to have seven years out, who demand it to fund it correctly, demand it to that because they see what's in it for them. It'll be a high tide, you know, I'm talking to the choir, I guess I am, but it's, it, we have, to, what's been missing, and I'm new, but what's been missing is, is the high tide sales point of view that'll lift all boats and that someone will buy a vehicle from it. <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, what, what, I mean, economically speaking, livability speaking, get out of poverty speaking, uh, all that Sylvia's doing, all that stuff, it all ties together. But we lacked, uh, and I guess I'm talking to the wall back to my face, we lacked to engage everyone that can do that. So, um, you guys are the professionals. Um, I'm retired, so I've had time to dig into it. But the digging into it, sales has to be on ground level. At, at being at 30,000 foot that you're saying, like Mark and stuff, but still we have to engage the people who can turn that around and demand it, whether you're a D, R, X, Y, Z, because they know it's a benefit for themselves and the good. And I mean, that's, I guess, I'm, but we need to market that as an IPO thing. Because trust me, if you have a brand, you, you talk to Civil War when they opened up Lithia and they went public, they were, they, they had, you know, better cupcakes than we had here this morning, and they, you know, they, they, they put their best foot forward in city after city after city because they knew they were going to go public. And they've been very, very successful. And uh, matter of fact, we need to get him on board too because his son's taking over the business. <laughs> but uh, uh, um, anyway, that, that's the challenge I see. If we can, if we can do that, then, we, then we've got a long ways and we've been successful on doing this long seven-year program and all that for the whole of the state, not just parts of it. One thought that uh, struck me on the discussion about the pilot, so assuming that we get get the appropriation, um, and you know the, the selection of the pilots is going to be really critical on two two bases. One, obviously, you, you want to pick something that you could potentially scale up, and again, I think this helps make the case for the reinvestment strategy. But you also have to have some idea when you create the pilot what does success look like. That is, you know, what, what, what do you what, what tells you that it worked, uh, and, uh, and and what tells you that this would be scalable? So I think those are going to be really important questions that we need to uh, think 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 through uh, if in fact we have the the ability and the capacity to make those investments. And probably the other piece to that is what do we need to know up front um, to be able to say we will scale it. Successful. See, it's, it's not just a successful pilot, it's what do you do with that success? That's a hard question to answer. Yeah. Um, we had a lot of programs come through um, through the Beaverton School District. If it's shiny and bright, we're going to do it, we're going to implement it. And um, we have some Title I schools and then some non-Title I schools. And the Title I schools have access to additional funds to be able to do things. And I think as we do this pilot and as we look forward, we have to be committed to make sure that we provide the support and resources for them to actually do what the pilots were able to do. You can't expect um, a non-Title I school to implement the developmental reading assessment when they don't have the additional support to be able to to do that assessment with each and every child. So as we build it, to really dig in and understand what it took for them to be successful and then um, share that out and let other people build what will work for them, but give them the support and the resources so they can do that. And, and that will build the trust. If we, if we don't, if we just say, this worked here and now we expect you to implement it, right. um, we'll fall on our faces and that won't help us. Group. Um, well, <clears throat> I, I, I think I have enough um, uh, to basically rebuild this page uh, with an eye toward um, how <clears throat> how to how to make this sound more like a a um, a lens that leads to sustainability and greater demand. I mean, I like that that framing because that's really what was. In, in, in my mind. Um, I do think that the categories here for the most part pass muster 
from you know in, in terms of these are the buckets and so on. Um, if not, well, when you see this again, which you will, um, you know, one of the things that I want to do with this is then to lay this out against the next, you know, sort of 10 years of what essentially governor would be revenue projections. Because then it begins to really take on, uh, you know, a very, a very different density uh, of a plan. And the work that the board then has to answer, which is sort of a, where this conversation began today, which is, okay, <clears throat> now you see what this work looks like for the next seven years, and you have a chance to understand some of the thick pockets of work that we're going to be in. Um, I guess there would be two questions. One would be, you know, who's all in um, from the standpoint of wanting to, to, to continue to do this kind of work, and B, you know, are we structured as a board? Do we have the horsepower, the capacity, uh, the, the, the infrastructure uh, to be able to do this? And I'm not talking about individuals here. I'm really talking about from, a, from an organizational standpoint. We will, by that time, be, you know, three years old or thereabouts. And, you know, it's a reasonable question to then start asking the question about our own capacity to get to the, the high water mark that, 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 that Dick was just referring to. Uh, you know, from a from a just a structural standpoint, um, and uh, and committee standpoint, and how we're how we're functioning. My own sense is, and I was asked this question this morning by Vice <coughs> Chair. You know, sort of, what do I think we do well, and what don't I think we do well? To be perfectly honest with you, in my sense of that of that of that question, um, I declined to answer it this morning, Governor. Just so you know, I chickened out. Um, but 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 my sense of now that you're here, I got a little bit more nerve. Um, but my sense of the, the my sense of the uh, of the answer is that I, I think that we are still a group. We are not a team, and there's a huge difference in my mind. And so the more this group groups this thing through it, I don't think group will get where any of these outcomes need to be. I really don't. Um, the groupness of us causes us to become micromanagers, and that's just not our highest and best use. The groupness of us causes this to be a conversation that oftentimes is absent data and filled with emotion, and therefore we get ourselves taken down lots of, you know, lots of different roads. Um, and that what we need is to actually start thinking about ways by which to build a team. I mean, a real, you know, like a real synergistic, uh, team that has meetings like this where new ideas and new notions and new research and new new ways of looking at a problem and new ways of so uh, really kind of being a solution center for the state uh, that the solutions to these problems are are scalable in some cases are not in other cases some people are going to have some great ideas that are going to be working in one section of the state, and never, you'd never be able to do this in, in, in another section. So we have to be able to find filters that allow us to be the best that we can be, understandably then, you know, link that to the best practice that can be uh, uh, put out statewide. And I think that the, the question about the board's capacity and how we ultimately want to do that gets raised over and over and over again in my mind around five years out, six years out, seven years out, you know, when we're really having to do some heavy sledding around some major, major thick issues. And the one that's on our docket right now that always produces this is this question of what's going to happen if somebody doesn't do well, right? That, put, that pushes us right up into the, into the fray of, you know, what happens, who, who does what, when, where, and how. And it, 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 it's, it's, it, it's always kind of a, uh, of a problematic moment, um, but I would hope it doesn't have to be in the future because I'm, there's no intention here to, to cause anybody to, you know, to, to be either left behind or to be left alone. And either one of those conditions, we will have failed. I'm not leaving anybody, as long as I can find them on a GPS. <laughs> right, which I got in my car. I, they cannot be left alone, and their data can't be left alone. And what's happening in their schools and districts, and community colleges and universities can't be left alone. 
And the truth be known, there are some people that are praying beyond all hope that we will just leave them alone. Even if we don't go away. They're just praying that, they'll, they'll, that we'll just leave them alone. And that just can't be, you know, so in this tight, loose world that I'm, you know, dancing in, I just think that's, that's, that's where this issue now comes up, you know, most, most handily. And, you know, I, I'm, you know, we're all going to try to facilitate it as best as we can, but, but the truth is the truth here. Well, I think, uh, I think the, the, the question of what happens if somebody's not doing well is one that really needs to be answered soon and fairly clearly. And, and, and I think the, because it's the other side of the handshake, we're not going to leave anybody alone, we're also not going to leave anybody behind. And so the, the intervention needs to be a, a, an intervention that's supportive to try to actually get them figure out what's, what's, what's not working and get, get us there without a, you know, without a judgmental approach, which is, look, here's the data. And so, I mean, I think that's, that's in a conversation we haven't, it's, it's, you're right, it's sort of hovering around out there. It's making a lot of people pretty nervous. And the sooner we can get that on the table, maybe even just here at a, in a setting, I didn't have that conversation. I think the, you're ready. You've got the answer, right? No, no, not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> when you're finished. I'm done. <laughs> oh, sorry. I always defer to you, Nancy. Uh, well, I was just thinking we did start a little bit with the model focus in priority schools. And I'm not saying it's a perfect system. I'm not saying it's easy, but I do know some priority schools that are feeling they're getting a lot of help. And, you know, I think we still want to look at, did we do that right? But I do know schools that felt bad in the beginning, but now they have some coaches that are really helping them. They, they feel hope around knowing where to go. And so the other part of that sort of model is this idea of exemplars and pilots. And so once I think we get to take some ground on that, you know, I think about some of the ideas we wove into the EL strategic plan that you'll hear about next time. So that idea of building these networks, which it also leads to that, and the idea of identifying exemplars, and then how together we mentor one another uh, from community to community. Once we get a chance to start doing that and uh, get a chance to describe the components that change the culture and get that sort of wheel turning, I think will help all of us have that language. It will also gain some trust, I think, that we know how to get that done. Mark? Yeah, we're ready to the thing about this document, too, and I'm looking at the results. The majority of these results aren't just education. Right. So if you think about all the audiences that are going to impact the results component, isn't our job in some way to be a facilitator, to be a cheerleader, to be a communicator? We've talked over and over today about engaging our communities, engaging our communities over and over. And I'm just looking at this document. To me, that's the one that you know, we have OEIB's vision, we have a lot of ed jargon in there. Mm -hmm. This is the one that could resonate that you could take out to any agency, any parent. Just think it out loud. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. That this is the one that makes OEIB bigger than P20. It's about changing the lives of Oregonians. That's what these results are. Yeah. And this is the doc to kind of show that. You, you originally talked about, you know, this is a chance for the legislators, you know, to say, well, so what? You know, been down this road before. But we're going we're saying we're gonna deliver something differently, but it's our role to facilitate and engage, not necessarily have all the answers. Yeah. It's kind of been a theme of today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when, when when we say results, we talked a lot about everyone's commitment. Is this results or is this that we really have a shared commitment by all of the stakeholders that this is what we want to see? I mean, that to me is when we actually succeed, when we have that shared commitment that we're all working towards these things. I think we'll get there. Hey, yeah. I think of Danielson's model. What is an exceptional teacher? It's when we have a classroom that basically runs itself. Yeah. So you've created that synergy that now it's just rising up from the ground level and you created the vision? Yeah, I think that, I don't have to slip out of here, but I think that the distinction, I think what you're both saying is, you got to get past, are we going to go here? 
two, um, we're going to get there. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and we're definitely seeing that with the CCOs. They, for a while, they really didn't really want to go there. And now, once they realize that they're going to go there, they can, for a, then, then, it just, um, then the creativity and commitment just begins to bubble up. Yeah. It won't without, it's got to have both ends. Yes. Yep. Okay. Leave you in the hands of uh, Nancy or Gavel, so I go. Uh -huh. <laughs> so watch out. Watch out. <laughs> Other comments? Well, I, I think we need, excuse me, I think uh, if they put an example of the Oregon Youth Authority, Fairbourse and I have been throughout the state trying to get re-entry of the people, young people coming out of the, and, and we, we've been controversial audiences, and it hasn't been one place, whether it's Selma, whether it's Grants Pass, Medford, Salem, Eastern Oregon, that it hasn't been somebody in the audience say, hey, I can take that on. So I think we just need to be out there in the community of the people who have heard this story here. And I think we'll get a lot of buy-in. Any other comments? Yes. I'm hearing some just reoccurring themes, yep. so I'm feeling we might be at the point where we've gotten the information we need to um, <clears throat> allow OEIB and the staff to move forward and take this to the next level. So unless someone has something else they, they want to add, we could just say we're done for the day. Anyone have anything else? I just thought the day was great. I think this is exactly what I was hoping when we talked about a retreat. We'd be able to talk. We'd be able to, I mean, I thought it was well facilitated. I thought the docs were great. And this was a, this was a good OEI. Okay, so this sounds like a debrief. So anyone else want to <laughs> add? That's great, Mark. <laughs> anyone else want to add to the work. debrief? Are we good? That sums it up. Let's say that. that yeah, that's some. July, yeah. I just have a social event with ELC. Social yeah. event, you know, that place that we had it before. Yeah. That's why you have to do that. Yeah. yeah. Just don't tell Gail. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that this sounds really good. Set it up. Okay. Thanks for the hard work. I think it was great. Thank you.